Hello friends, welcome. Uh, this is the series that we have been running uh, for some time and uh, this uh, is linked with uh, discussions and analyses on romantic writing, the romantic trend in English literature. Uh, we have covered uh, large areas of romanticism so far through lectures that uh, me and my team, my friends in the team have been uh, giving and uh, today's lecture is centered on uh, two uh, romantic writers. Charles Lamb and Thomas De Quincey. Uh, these two writers mainly were active in the field of prose uh, and uh, they uh, left an impact on the audience of the time. And uh, since they were writing in prose like Hazlitt on which already a lecture has been uh, done, uh, these people uh, in prose uh, represented the point of view of romanticism and from that lens they looked at the world around them. It was very useful because mostly uh, writers would uh, ex express themselves in poetry and the romanticism uh, mainly is monopolized by the poetic mode. But uh, authors, uh, other uh, readers also would have wondered as to what exactly these people stood for because poetry gives hints. Poetry is generally coded and through those codes when it speaks that appeals more to uh, the, the, the inner uh, aspect of uh, every person's personality, but then people want to ask the questions that are addressed, you know, in that kind of poetry. So, uh, this help came, so to say, from those writers who thought about the Romantic period, raised issues about uh, uh, that period, also uh, commented on the trends of the time, uh, which is not the task of the poet. And uh, Charles Lamb is uh, one of the rare ones in this breed uh, who uh, writes prose, who takes up issues, who looks at the world uh, from the romantic uh, angle and uh, who reflects upon uh, the uh, issues and questions of the time uh, in that mode. So, we have uh, today this uh, Charles Lamb as a, as a thinker, as an essayist and uh, a romantic essayist is one who, who uh, represents the romantic po point of view uh, and uh, discusses uh, things you know that are of contemporary interest and therefore uh, I start this lecture by saying that uh, uh, he is a romantic essayist. An essayist who takes up the cause of romanticism in a positive way. He thinks about romanticism. He explains the uh, issue uh, in theoretical terms. Uh, he tells people also about what is not romanticism. So, uh, let us uh, you know let's discuss this uh, essays today and uh, Charles Lamb also had the name Elia uh, under which he wrote. So, uh, essays of Elia uh, there, there are one or two books and in those books you know he uh, discusses uh, different aspects of life at the time. Now, uh, when I refer to the time uh, I have in mind the years you know that, that, that he lived from 1775 to 1834. And uh, 1775, so he was growing up in the 1780s and uh, when French Revolution occurred then he was uh, 14 years old, uh, good enough, uh, uh, old enough to understand what was going on across the border. And uh, he must have been moved by uh, the, the uh, you know pictures that uh, were coming to him, uh, you know of the, of the uh, trend at that time. Uh, England was not directly involved in the French Revolution, but was a very close onlooker of the entire situation. And uh, obviously, if you hear about, if I hear about something that is happening next door, uh, I, uh, I, I would like to compare that situation and that event with the situation and event at home. So, the uh, young people of that time would have definitely compared what was going on in England in the uh, latter half of the 18th century and uh, what went uh, you know on in uh, France which was uh, just across the border. And uh, the two things were totally different, uh, you know, uh, uh, Augustan period as 18th century is called in England was a period of stabilization. Uh, all, all the old values which were useful for society, uh, they were being discussed and people were asked to, uh, you know, uh, take interest in them. And England was uh, going from strength to strength and uh, as a state, uh, as, a, as, as a system, as a regime, uh, England enjoyed the kind of stability that France did not at that time enjoy. But you know there is a uh, limitation of uh, uh, you know uh, life if one is under the uh, phase of stabilization because that stabilization uh, does not uh, uh, equally benefit all the people. It uh, uh, affects and influences some and uh, it, it goes against the interests of others. So uh, there must have been 
a, a great sense of disenchantment in England uh, in the in the 18th century, and that that uh, disenchantment came to the fore when they started comparing uh, the English situation to the French situation. France was very angry uh, around the time of uh, uh, French Revolution. Uh, it was uh, uh, being cru uh, French people were being crushed under the weight of what, what was called monarchy, and they rose in revolt. And the revolt was bloody. Lots and lots of people died there, uh, staked their lives there. Uh, they, they, they were full of passion. They wanted change. They wanted to throw away monarchy and establish uh, republicanism under the leadership of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. And that would have been very enthusing for the young uh, people, you know, in England. And if uh, uh, people like Charles Lamb who lived in that era, who were uh, in, in, in their teens at the time, and they were hearing uh, news on daily basis regarding the revolt and the assertion of the romantic people, then it would have been full of excitement and enthusiasm. So that made him, that gave him the sensibility of a romantic. Uh, because he's 14 years old when the French Revolution occurs, and the 10 years, starting from 18, uh, 10, 11 years, starting from 1889 to 1900, would have been full of excitement for Charles Lamb. So that turned him a romantic, and he started expressing himself, uh, his ideas, his uh, perceptions, his reflections in romantic terms. When I say romantic term, wh what exactly do I mean? Uh, already I have explained this, but then uh, let us uh, you know, read this uh, quotation from Hazlitt, who has said, and uh, I am reading it, Hazlitt said that Lamb had succeeded as a writer not by conforming to the spirit of the age, but in opposition to it. What, what, what does he mean? How do you conform to the spirit of the age? And why do you go against it? These are the questions that uh, can disturb you, that can disturb me. And let me explain that conforming to the spirit of the age means that you are uh, agreeing with whatever is going on around you uh, in, in terms of ideas, in terms of influences, in terms of events and situations uh, and politics for that matter. But uh, uh, Lamb was not uh, one of those you know, who would conform to the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age being stability, spirit of the age being order, the spirit of the age being culture and spirit of the time, uh, the, the, the behavior, the manners, the principles and norms, all that is spirit, and this person stood against it. He did not conform to it, and he, he was in opposition to this. So this is to be kept in mind, and when he decides to be opposite to the uh, spirit of the age, then you know, he would write a different kind of stuff. So that is what exactly is Romanticism. Romanticism is impatient with the established order. Romanticism raises questions. Romanticism uh, puts the clock in, in, in a different direction. Uh, in, uh, uh, it puts the interest on a certain page. And that page uh, asserts equality. That doesn't make a distinction between the, 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 the people above and the people below. That believes in equality. And that sees all human beings as equal and as part of humanity. So this is what is uh, going to be opposite to the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age in the 18th century in England, to which uh, Charles Lamb belonged, the spirit of the age was that, you know, there, is, there has to be an order, there has to be a set of norms, and all of us should adhere to it. You can't criticize the norms, you can't criticize the, 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 the principles of the time, because that would be going against the interest of the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age is agreement, and this person decided that he will not abide by the spirit of the age, he will not agree with things as they are going on in England and therefore he became a romantic. So this is important and uh, if you understand the spirit of the age from another angle, then there is another spirit of the age that is emerging. In 1880, 1890, uh, 1895, uh, 1900, a new kind of spirit is emerging. That spirit is romanticism. That spirit is uh, giving more, you know, uh, 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 support to things you know that uh, will uh, stay later, that will change the order. So this is what is, uh, is romanticism in general, and this is where you know uh, our uh, writer Charles Lamb uh, belongs. Now, uh, I'll just extend this argument further with the help of another quotation that that, uh, that, that you can read on the on, on the screen. Lamb is antiquarian. What is, what is the word antiquarian? And antiquarian means interest in the old. Uh, antiquarian and, and that old has to be actually not uh, a century old or uh, two centuries old. It means really very old. It, it, it's another name for being ancient. And the ancient civilization 
uh, was not very clear, uh, clearly defined for, for, for the young people of the 19th, uh, 18th century. And uh, this person went back to that period when societies were totally different, when they did not abide by the, the current, the contemporary interests uh, that, that, that they saw in front of their eyes. And therefore, they looked for inspiration uh, from, uh, looked at the ancient period. So, he was antiquarian in that sense. Uh, this is in fact a common trait of all the romantic poets that they go back to the ancient past where you know things are hazy and that haziness gives them new ideas. They, they, they feel thrilled you know by something that they can't fully understand because full understanding means that that understanding will uh, put its restrictions on us. But if you go back to the time, that ancient time when things were forming, then you feel enthused, you feel excited, you feel inspired by those things and then want to experiment now in your time. So, he was an antiquarian and the reflective exploiter of nostalgia. What does it mean? Uh, th th this, this is uh, talking like Hazlitt, but reflective exploiter. Now, the, the word appears uh, to be a uh, negative, but what is meant is the positive uh, <coughs> meaning the hidden behind it. He reflects, he thinks, he wonders, uh, he, he gives his views on something that he sees. That is reflection. He is reflecting means he is thinking. And why, 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 why is he called exploiter? Uh, viewers think about it. Exploiter here is not in the bad sense that he is taking advantage of something. It only means that uh, this person is using a new kind of a method through understanding and uh, that, that new method is to understand nostalgia. Nostalgia, the longing for the past, not acceptance of the present. You go back to the past and uh, you always tell yourself how, how good was that age. It was a great age and I want to live in that time. And uh, one, one falls in love with, you know, um, the bad life patterns that existed in the ancient period. And uh, what is uh, Lamb doing by going back to that period, by exploiting uh, uh, and by, you know, reflecting upon it, thinking about it, what does he gain? This is a question that all of us can face and, and have our own answers. So, far as I am concerned, I would say that nostalgia gives you a chance, gives me a chance to look in a new manner at my surroundings. Uh, you know, you compare something that happened earlier, people in those days were very spontaneous, they were bound by, uh, you know, the human bond and there were kind of uh, relationships, you know, that, that were based on affection, that were based on love, that, that were based on loyalty, that were based on friendship and those, uh, you know, uh, relationships are no more relevant in the, in the modern day period, in the, in the 18th century. Therefore, you are using the old knowledge against the contemporary knowledge. Now, that is the meaning of, you know, uh, uh, reflective exploitation. You, you, you are just using nostalgia to attack the contemporary period and that is what Lamb is doing successfully. He had something turned his back on the issues of the day. You see, this is what is, uh, what is meant, that you do not talk about the issues of the day because talking about the issues of the day means that you are accepting them as right, but no. You don't belong there, you don't belong to the present, you belong to the past. And that past, you know, gives you energy enough to look for the future. So, on one side is the present, on the other side is the past and the future. You use the past to pave the way for a new kind of future and the present is not necessarily taking you in that direction. So, you criticize the present. Isn't it a, an interesting situation that uh, you don't look at the present critically, you look at the past uh, you know, uh, from, from the angle of ins getting inspiration and then you make a future after your heart. You say this is how the world should be and this is how the world is not behaving. So, in a way, uh, you are set against, I am set against the present, but then I want to make future in the light of what existed in the past. This is what Romanticism is. Romanticism is forward looking only in this sense that the old values are redefined and then they are, they, they are sought to be established uh, through effort through writing, through talking to people, uh, you know, so that the, a new kind of dawn should, should appear uh, in your midst, in, in, in our midst and that we uh, have a kind of happiness that the uh, generation of which we are a part is not able to enjoy. Preferring the byways of the past to the highways of the present, preferring the byways, small, small parts, small paths, uh, small, small, you know, uh, streets. These you prefer and uh, the, the highway of the present that is actually uh, rejected. What is the highway of the present? And once again, I, I repeat the words that I said in the beginning that 
England is going from strength to strength. It is becoming at, at the world level an economic might, but then at home it is crushing the ordinary masses. So uh, it is a highway. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, nothing is allowed, you know, which is not of a good standard. All people who are, are uh, you know, helpless or people who are uh, faced with difficulties, those people would not be uh, would not be allowed to walk on the highway, to move on the highway. Highway belongs only to the rich people because they want benefits from the system of the time. So uh, this person prefers the byways and will and, 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 and highways you know he will keep apart. So it is a very good way of presenting and uh, the, the, the language itself you know shows that uh, uh, this person a lamb is an inspired person. Here Sanders this, this person whom I quoted has presented the view of Hazlitt. So Hazlitt in fact said, said this thing and uh, said it in such a manner that it uh, gave the perspective in clear terms. Now uh, I will just uh, say a few things about Elia the persona. Uh, of, of, of the writer uh, uh, Lamb, he writes under the name of Elia, and Elia, the author of Charles Lamb, the cha uh, author in the author Charles Lamb, he writes under this name, uh, establishes real rapport with contemporary reader, readers. You know, uh, his readers would definitely uh, be the educated people, the, li the literate people, and the people you know who live by ideas. They will be very happy to, to, to read him. They don't have enough resources, but they won't mind because uh, resources, uh, you know, will uh, join them with the, the, the powers that be, the, the rich people. But then these are the middle class people, uh, and and therefore the contemporary readers, those who read literature at that time and read uh, uh, Lamb's essays, uh, they would be uh, uh, you know, have a sense of achievement when when, when they read his essays. And uh, subsequent uh, reprints of the two original collections first published in 1823 and 1833. So there are two books uh, that, that are generally there uh, in his name and these you know books uh, are essays of Elia and in them uh, there is a great discussion on uh, you know the, the trends of the time, the, the trends you know that, that, that are the highways and uh, he is criticizing them but he is also offering an alternative. The alternative is that you should live a simple life, you should be humble, uh, you should be you should be critical uh, you you should be daring you should be courageous and that at the same time you should be lucid so these 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 are the essays that say this and because uh, the people who are deprived people who are the, uh, are members of the middle class those people want you know that uh, the contemporary readers should get new ideas and lamb is definitely giving new ideas to the people the essays cultivate a turn and uh, lamb admired in the uh, 17th and 18th centuries and uh, uh, his mentors were Bacon, Brown, Walton, Fuller, Edison and Steele. Now uh, you, know, you know the romantic uh, uh, people generally criticize romanticism for being you know too uh, uh, revolutionary but no uh, romantic, romantics can take strength and good ideas from uh, all places uh, in, in, in history and they are in fact deeply steeped in history. Now imagine uh, Bacon was writing his essays uh, in, in the late uh, uh, 16th and early 17th century. Brown, Walters, Fullers were also there at that time. Addison and Steele were there in the 18th century and all these people in their own time were big literary names and Lamb read them, he found them very useful uh, and, and he took inspiration from them and he called them his mentors. It is these people who formed, uh, who, who helped you know Charles Lamb grow uh, in a direction that will take him towards what can be called meaning, usefulness and happiness. So uh, Lamb is not alone in all this. He actually belongs to a group of people. All of them have the romantic temperament, the romantic sensibility and they are not present bound. They, they, they are not uh, exactly with the powers that be in the 18th century. They are with people in the 18th century of course, that, that their generation uh, wants to have a new world, uh, they, they want to create a new world and they will then you know seek their roots in the uh, 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 past that is recent and the past that is ancient. So they take the uh, 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 inspiration from the ancient past, not that past you know which, which was rational with, within quotes, that rational past you know always defines things for you very clearly and does not allow you scope to. Uh, you know, uh, explore, uh, uh, scope to uh, you know uh, research, scope to find out 
uh, search for things. But then, uh, if if you go beyond reason, you go into the area of you know feelings, uh, sen sensibilities, sensitivities. If you go into that area which is not clear and which you know asks you to, to come near it so that uh, you can throw your light and draw your meanings, that is what romanticism is. And uh, Bacon, uh, uh, Brown, uh, Walton, and Fuller, and Edison, and Steele, uh, all these people. And uh, the other meaning uh, regarding these uh, uh, people is that all of them wrote essays and uh, th th their essays became famous at that time. In fact, uh, uh, with Bacon and later on uh, other people in the 17th and 18th centuries, the essay is growing further. Now, what is the uh, purpose of writing an essay? And as that essay is not the kind of essay that we have uh, in India or we have in the 20th century. It is a different kind of an essay. It is an essay that gives pleasure and ideas at the same time. It is a short essay. It talks to the audience. Uh, it does not uh, research. It, it does not uh, you know, uh, give you any study. It gives you wisdom. So, it is a different kind of an essay. Uh, I would say that the uh, 18th century essay and the 19th century essay in the hands of the romantic essayists, that essay actually is very close to poetry. Uh, Bacon cannot be uh, you know, uh, called a poet by any uh, you know, stretch of imagination, but then he writes short things and he says many things very pithily, you know a short sentence, a half sentence, he would emphasize a word and he would leave certain gaps you know, so that you can think yourself and fill up the gap with your imagination, with your reason. So, this is, this is how you know, uh, essay comes into being in the hands of these writers. 17th century people, 18th century people, they have already uh, uh, established the tradition of essay writing. So, uh, Lamb takes the uh, uh, practice from there, he, he uh, takes inspiration from there and then he says, okay, I will react and respond to the challenges of the day, the intellectual, ideological challenges of the day with the help of prose. So, the uh, first point that I raised was regarding prose, then that prose was in the essay mode where an idea will first be uh, you know uh, tentatively uh, not, not very clearly but tentatively introduced in the beginning and then you start exploring that idea further and uh, while doing this you are enjoying the use of language you are enjoying the use of imagination you are bringing in uh, this thing and that thing without any plan and in a way you are writing a creative uh, sort of a prose piece so uh, he takes this inspiration from these people they are his mentors, they tell him how to write an essay and once he has mastered the art of uh, writing an essay, then as a true romantic, he would like to define things for himself. So, this is and uh, the, the last sentence is, he, he, he super adds his own delight in whimsy, reminiscence and digression. Now, a serious essayist of uh, our time, you know, mostly we write uh, academic stuff, we, we, we write long articles, papers. And uh, the sometimes you know, the, the footnotes are as, as much as the text or sometimes even more and we tell people that oh, well this is how we argue. But that is not the kind of essay Lamb writes. Lamb writes about his personal experiences and for personal experiences you do not mention dates. For personal experiences you do not even mention names. Uh, sometimes you just talk about the impressions of the period in, in which you live. You reminisce, you talk about your family, you, you talk about your friends, you talk about somebody you met on the roadside and uh, all those things you know would, would have helped you understand the world better and what you do is that you uh, uh, tentatively, uh, accidentally, you uh, using charms, uh, you using your memory and sometimes you know, no, not your memory but even your wish. You want to uh, think that this is what happened and therefore, uh, in your uh, uh, essay, you can longingly say that you know this, this might have happened and then you start believing also that this would have happened. This is what the what is the crux of reminiscence. Reminiscence means that you just uh, on the basis of memory you talk about your personal experiences and then the last thing is digression. What is digression? Digression is that you are not on the trodden path. You, you have already uh, said that you will say something uh, concerning a particular subject, but when you start writing then you are reminded of something else. What will you do? Will, will you keep that away because that is not relevant to your discussion? Generally, most scholars today would do this. They, they are writing then essays uh, of a different kind. But essay writing for uh, Lamb uh, in, the, in the late and uh, in, in the in the early 19th century would be writing according to his mind, the, his his wishes, uh, the, the the movement that naturally the mind uh, makes, you know, uh, in, in in one's own or in one's own horizon. So digression 
if you want to leave the path and say something else j- then you are digressing Th- then you are being to say irrelevant but nothing is irrelevant uh, because the person uh, remembered it uh, in the middle of the discourse in 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 the middle of the in the middle of articulating one's ideas therefore digressions also help now by way of reference let me tell you that uh, some of these things were common uh, to both the essays of the romantic period and the uh, 18th century novelists i particularly refer to one novelist uh, john fielding and henry fielding uh, who used digression in the novels uh, he, he has a plot uh, you know in, in in his novels and uh, that there is the story that's the narrative and in the middle of the story starts he wants to say something about a social problem so he, a whole chapter will be given to that social problem if he wants to talk about religion then he will he'll start you know bring, he will bring it in and then he will make a character say all those things which are not a part of the uh, narrative or of the story but then he wants to say it and later on you can connect uh, the way you want but then he is not bothered that is called digression and uh, lamb uses digression to very good effect and uh, you would know that uh, when you tell a story uh, you know to an audience to an actual audience you stand in front of uh, you know a uh, hundred people or or 50 people and you are telling them a story directly at that point of time you don't bother about relevance you are you are saying and something uh, you know interesting emerges uh, in in front of you and then you say okay let me at least share by way of reference that this is what happened and i'm reminded of this so he's using you know these these things whimsies reminiscences digressions at that point of time and that is how you know a uh, uh, lamb delights lamb you know amuses lamb makes you wonder uh he he uh, uh, you know excites your imagination and and and, and he gives uh, new insights and he in a way tickles your imagination so that you know you are very happy reading him and sometimes you are sentimental sometimes you are happy sometimes you are, you, you feel like crying you are full of kindness all this is what constitutes the romantic essay in the hands of uh, uh lamb so lamb you know uh, gives us uh, delight uh, gives us uh, a kind of philip to our thinking and to our imagination and the same tradition is continued by his uh, uh, junior by, by by his successor uh, thomas de quincey who was a few years younger uh, than him and uh, uh, one uh, you know uh, <coughs> peculiar thing about this person is that uh, he was more and more focused upon the mind the human mind which is not the case with uh, uh, lamb lamb would talk about the problems of the world surrounding him Uh, he would talk about children he would talk about all ordinary problems of life he would criticize things you know which were uh, rather uh, uh, this worldly and uh, uh, which would uh, concern only what can be called the things of utility but when we think of uh, thomas de quincey then we associate him with uh, the mind the human mind its mysteries and uh, uh, he's born in 1785 so he would be uh, younger by a few years uh, uh to uh, his uh, predecessor lamb and he dies in 1859 so uh, uh the the span of time uh, is is uh, spent by uh, de quincey uh, to explore the mind in fact uh, i have just given this title to a kind of title to subtitle to this discussion which is called uh, explorer of the mind in the late uh, 18th and early 19th centuries people had started turning to the mind before that they would only talk about social problems they would talk about the person in the street and the person in the street always minds you know uh, uh, houses on both the sides or or or, or the way ahead uh, or the people who are crossing the uh, uh, crossing him of uh, coming uh, from uh, from the front and passing him by or uh, following him and then overtaking him to, to, to you know go go ahead of him that is what society is society also is the fields society also is the institutions society also is the educational places society is also is the market so all the time writers come in touch with the the people in general come in touch with other people they they look at these things some of them see them as facility some some of some others you know will see them as challenges but then all the time our mind is taken by the social problems at home also there is the family institution so one thinks of uh, one's parents one thinks of one's children one thinks of the, the relatives who visit you or whom you visit later on and uh, your entire time is taken by the meeting or uh, disagreeing or agreeing uh, with, with people of of of, of your generation <coughs> that is what society uh, you know compels you to do all the time 
but then there can be other people those people don't want to be a part of this world in that sense they they don't want to speak to others uh, beyond a point they 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 uh, don't involve themselves in the affairs of the world what do they do they want to stand you know <coughs> in a corner they want to sit in a corner they want to read and uh, through reading they f- they go further into their own minds uh, in, into the process of 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 their of their heart and uh, there they remain so you can say that they are loners that those people don't mix with people they don't befriend others they don't help others nor do they seek help from others so they are not that way social in nature are there such people in in, in today's world my answer is yes there are, there are many people uh, you know who, uh, many people who would not be interested in the, the, the affairs of the market in buying and selling they, they 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 might do a job in order to earn bread and butter but once that is ensured they they they, they will just take to books and read them and uh, when you read uh, the books then you you are uh, you know uh, stirred in a different manner than when you don't you don't become a part of this world in that sense in the physical sense what do they, what do you do then some of you some of us in that situation start entering our mind and think of our spirit inside us what is going on inside us what is the human mind or uh, is it the functioning of the human brain or or is there some other force that that is compelling us to you know live on uh, with, a, with 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 the help of th- this uh, other force that is there active in our mind these are the questions that we can't easily answer but then <coughs> there are questions and if there are questions then some people would spare time to go into this problem and uh, how does human mind function now of course there is a whole philosophical uh, you know uh, argument Uh, with respect to this and some people have studied the the uh, you know senses and uh, those senses you know connect us with the world but those senses also are us and somebody might start uh, i might start saying what does the sense mean how does it work how does touch work how how, how is touching you know processed by the human mind uh, how, how you know working on something outside also gets processed by the human mind to find a way or uh, to the solution uh, that 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 you know arose in front of us so this exploration of the mind is that way very interesting and uh, there are some writers who just uh, engage themselves with this idea uh, viewers let me tell you that uh, this may have been the general trait of romanticism also but the romanticism would not involve uh, itself with 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 social problems they were not involved with you know collecting people to put pressure on the regime and then to uh, compel it to change its policies they will not play any political role there uh, if they if they find the, to to uh, that, that changing the world is good then they they will uh, involve themselves with it only romantically they they would, they would be happy with napoleon who is changing the world so that they, they would give him support some of them would, would also fight for some time but then they are doing it for an ideal so in a way they are pursuing an ideal which is working in their mind so romantics you know started thinking about the mind and about the imagination one of the first you know thinkers who systematically uh, went into this aspect was coleridge and uh, you know he he would uh, uh, in fact uh, from the angle of the mind he would start looking at the old texts even shakespearean texts and and he would start you know imagining that this is what happened to a particular character uh, in in shakespeare and for this reason he behaved in the way as shakespeare showed him so what is what was coleridge doing he was basically trying trying to read the mind of a character who was imagined by shakespeare in a play this is a romantic trait and uh, there we we have with us uh, a writer uh, in the, in the early 19th century uh, uh, de quincey who will be 15 years when uh, at the turn of the century and this person takes more and more into the recesses of the mind how does mind function and one reason you know that uh, one one way in which you can study your mind is by giving some kind of a stimulant to your mind uh it, it it can be some a, a drug that you take and that drug you know makes you conscious about uh what is going on in your mind you start seeing seeing dreams you you, you start seeing visions you start seeing you know unnatural or uh uh difficult complex images in in your mind what do they show they are all you know the, uh, are the uh, products of the stirring of the human mind the mind has been stirred by a drug and then the drug is uh, makes you into- intoxicated and uh, what was not there uh, is, is visible in front of us who created that Th- that illusion that illusion is created by the mind itself so it, it actually starts throwing some light on the working of the mind when you take a drug 
and uh, in fact uh, opium in those days was, was one such substance you know that people would take and then you know they would enter into the realm of the dream and uh, this person's book for, for which he became famous is called the confessions of an english opium eater so he would eat opium and uh, when you eat opium when one, one eats opium then one's mind is excited and one is cut off from the day to day routine of the world in fact uh, th th this is uh, one drug you know that th that is given uh, by uh, doctors administered by doctors to relieve people of pain so you don't feel pain because your mind is taken away from uh, the situation of pain pain and you enter into a different realm altogether now, now that was a medicine but in the 90th century some writers started saying let us understand our mind with the help of opium so this person wrote a book you know the confessions of an english opium eater and why is he eat eating opium he is doing it in order to understand what is going on in his mind and uh, about mind not much is uh, not much is written not much is available but people only guessed about the mind and they used other, other methods they used the method of language for instance shakespeare uh, sometimes you know talks about the working of the mind in such a manner that he makes a character speak on the stage and the person speaks to himself and uh, when you speak to yourself when i when i speak to myself then there is no other person that I, that i am talking to which means that i am actually analyzing my own situation in my own mind now there were writers who were uh, engaging themselves with the problem of uh, human psychology but then they would do it through language now this person say let me take a drug let me uh, then later on tell people what i felt how i felt whether i was happy if i was happy why i was happy if i was unhappy if if i if i was terrified if there was a nightmare then, then how did it work so all those processes then would be written down by Do thomas de quincey is that a good option for a writer this question i ask from yourself viewers and i ask also from myself is that a good option for a writer to write about the mental processes well you think about it my answer is yes it, it's an option in the sense you know that the writer in the act of writing is talking to oneself to to uh, i'm 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 talking to my, to to myself when i write because then there's nobody who is listening to me and i i have the page in front of me and my mind is asking me to put certain words there uh, in, in my own hand on the paper i'm doing that so in a way i'm just engaging with my own mind and if i know that uh, with a drug my mind will start working differently then i'd like to find out this this is what what, what is the purpose of uh, uh, thomas de quincey to write and uh, at the age of uh, uh, 15 uh, 36 years he publishes this book and this book you know created a stir created a uh, spreads a uh, uh, widespread interest in, uh, in in the book because people then started wondering that this is what mind was this is how mind worked and uh, mind can be disturbed when it is disturbed then it, it can see nightmares and in fact the study of dreams that uh, will be taken up by fried later uh, in time that would have something to do with this book that that, that uh, thomas de quincey wrote because he uh, uh, fried you know would analyze the situation of dreams in another sense uh, I, in just in passing i say that when you start studying the mind this way then you are taking yourself at the level of the body and at the level of the reality uh, which, which is the human being the real human being with a mind which means that you are not drawing then inspiration from an unknown force that you are you are, you are taking yourself off from uh, the divine power the, 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 that was uh, you know uh, referred to again and again through human history in different languages in different countries the 90th century thinkers because this is also the age of science science is coming up in a big way in 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 the, in the 90th century and then you know scientists also start trying to uh, you know uh, struggle uh the, the, the struggle to find out what how exactly mind works what what connection is there between the mind and the body is mind body is is, is uh, as, as i said is mind a functioning of the brain or is, or does, does mind have some kind of a connection with with religion with morality with with with, with the inner being as they, as they as they call it is that some inner being something else so one thing goes towards divinity or uh, the you know, goes towards uh, godliness goes towards uh, spiritualism and the other thing comes to the actual world in which human beings work and the, their minds also and uh, you know operate in a certain way so uh, it is that way a uh, very world centered this, this is matter centric uh, understanding you know uh, uh, 
confession, uh, uh, the, 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 op the influences of the opium on the mind, th th this is, uh, th this I would say is uh, materialistic. Th this is a matter center and uh, this is a big branch and uh, uh, psychology as you know uh, emerged in the 19th century and it uh, became a very big subject in the 20th century and in 21st century now psychology has developed still further. Then uh, I just uh, take up from this uh, a, 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 a phrase to, to, to make clear as to what exactly uh, Thomas de Quincey was doing with himself and with his mind. He was uh, an equivocating justification of drug taking. He was justifying drug taking first thing, let us let, 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 consider this. Why was he justifying drug taking? I, I already partly explained. I think he was justifying drug taking because he, he felt that by taking the drug, uh, we are actually uh, getting help from ourselves to understand us. So, one way is to uh, think, read books and uh, no, no, no others and uh, no, no, no one's own mind. Uh, or, you, or you sit back, relax and, and then, then see what happens to you and the third is that the same thing can be done by drug also and the drug has the facility of you know straight away putting you into, in, into a kind of stance uh, and, and uh, the uh, trance and, and that trance you know can you can recapture it later in rational terms and say that this is what you saw, this is what you felt, this, this is what, you, what disturbed you or this is what made you happy. So, uh, <coughs> There are other words that, that, that are here, uh, the word fascination is there, fascination uh, is to be uh, you know once again a, a trait of romanticism the, 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 that you feel you know uh, you, you are full of wonder and, 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 and you, you become very interested in uh, what is in front of you and you want to be there in that situation more and more. That is fascination. Fascination haunts us. The same idea uh, follows us, comes to us again and again. It assumes different interesting forms that, that that's what it does and then uh, you want to remain in that in the grip of that idea for a long time. That is what fascination is. Love is a fascination for instance. Liking is a fascination. You want a picture in front of you and then you want to look at it more and more. That is fascination. Uh, in the morning you know when you see different colors uh, on, on the sky then those colors you know make patterns and uh, sometimes you when, when go into a trance. That is fascination. So, this fascination can be better understood with the help of focusing upon the state of mind. So, this is what uh, this person is doing. So, uh, he is not sure as to what is right and what is wrong. He cannot definitely say he, he is under a drug and uh, he, th th that effect is uh, uh, lasting for quite some time and uh, he is going into this and that if and but. So, he is not very clear as to what exactly is the picture. Now, that is a very uh, you know uh, sensitive minds uh, sensitive minds you know a response to the world around us all of us as human beings uh, are uh, asking for answers but if answers don't come our way in in clear terms then we can at least keep struggling to have our answers and that struggle gives us a sense of pleasure so uh, <coughs> equivocating in my opinion is not a bad word uh, uh, equivocating means if and but you 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 say something and then you say no no it's not true uh, so, uh, it, is, it is good and it is not good, <coughs> it is true and it is not true, it is wrong and not wrong, that is what equivocation is, which means that you, you never come to a conclusion, but all the time you are struggling to understand things. And this person is equivocating and what is he doing? He says uh, <coughs> drug uh, can, can take you on the wrong side, on, on the wrong side, in, in the wrong direction. At the same time, it can also give you insights. So, and uh, see the other word that, that is being used in this contorted architecture of the soul. What does it mean? It is a very fine you know a coinage, a very very fine con uh, construction. Uh, contorted architecture, architecture is very straightforward, architecture has straight lines and uh, you know uh, uh, why th this kind of a frame will suit you better and uh, the, the more it suits the better and the more stable is the architecture. But if the ar architecture is contorted, it is changed, it is slightly imbalanced. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it does not make sense to you. Should that be good or bad? Should, should, should that be studied or not? Contorted thing means uh, something that is twisted un unnecessarily. Should, should the twisted unnecessarily, uh, unnecessary thing be uh, looked at with interest? My answer is yes, because then you face a problem 
and uh, you 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 engage with with, with that problem through through the abnormal situation in which you find it and uh, that can give you insights into the working of the problem so contorted picture of contor contorted architecture of the soul what is soul now most of us use the soul, soul in the religious sense but this person is using soul in the sense of state of mind the, the, that that you know, stability and that tranquility which comes after uh, you have happily concluded so that architecture of the soul that structure of the soul that map of the soul those lines you know which have a pattern of the soul and uh, soul otherwise is supposed to be uh, completely invisible and un unknowable but then uh, with the help of the drug uh, you you can always you know see that uh, this is what gave you pleasure you can't even explain it but then you became stable uh, the, the 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 drug you know makes you feel stable for some time so therefore your soul is happy and if your soul is happy at the end of the day uh, at, at at the end of taking a drug and then you go into the architecture of the soul architecture of the mind or ar ar architecture of the state of consciousness then naturally this thing is going to be extremely educative and uh, here you know uh, the, the, this the study of uh, addiction uh, and hallucination what is hallucination when you see dreams which are not there you, you you hallucinate you create your own dreams and your dreams last for 5 minutes 10 minutes and and, and you, you you remain half awake and and and, and you are you are there you are moving around also but you hallucinate hallucinate means you make your own picture you are you are walking on the street and you uh, you, you imagine that there is a street to be a kind of a uh, big mountain let's say and you are you are going up there so these these hallucinations you know uh, give a give an idea uh, of the picture and uh, that idea when captured later can uh, offer an insight into the working of the mind and into the uh, into the nature of the person oneself so you you know yourself better after uh, seeing uh, that mind you know in in, in, a, in an abnormal state <coughs> then you know there, there there is a different book that he wrote which was in the same vein as the one that we have quoted uh, uh, confessions of an opium eater and the second book was the collections of the lakes and the lake poets and he is a romantic poet and uh, you know uh, one one knows about the the lake and the people who are a part of the lake districts this is a mo uh, one of the most beautiful parts of england uh, where there are lakes and where, where there are woods forests and uh, the the atmosphere is calm the nature is in its best form the kind of scenic beauty that the lake districts in england have that beauty can be uh, compared with the best in the world uh, elsewhere so uh, romantic poets were in love with the lake districts uh, and they, they were born there wordsworth was there coleridge was there and and they spent all their lives in, in the lake, lake districts and they wrote about the lake districts the the, the lakes and the forests there and uh, this person also uh, would uh, would have gone there he, he met these people all of them were romantic poets and they were they were all you know uh, trading so to say uh, you know in, in in romanticism and they met and they discussed the different aspects of imagination so he writes a book about recollections of the lakes and the lake 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 poets and uh, here you know uh, i i'm sure that wordsworth uh, would uh, discuss with these people uh, uh, with, uh, with a sense of fascination something that uh, uh, de quincey would say coleridge would be his uh, comrade in arms uh, he would be uh, behaving the same manner as this uh, all of us know you know the kubla khan the poem by coleridge uh, you know was written under some kind of sub substance that he took so uh, they were all you know of one nature of all them one one mental makeup so they would compare and contrast their own experiences regarding writing poetry enjoying poetry understanding life together discussing things all of them and then they 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 they, uh, they, they would also reminisce the, the word that i explained earlier they they would talk about their personal you know uh, emotions and sentiments and uh, they would uh, you know malicious or negative inferences sometimes you know you, you one also is visited by evil uh, in life uh, evil is, is is a part of uh, human imagination so one can be good one can be bad also one can be cruel one can be kind so that cruelty and kindness they they, they form you know the, the 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 human being in fullness and uh, you 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 generally you make a you know a, a distinction between the, the two and you you adopt one and reject the other but the romantics would say that the two can coalesce into each other and that we can 
then understand a human being uh, in, in in one's wholeness, in in, in one's fullness, and uh, you know that 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 that's a better way of uh, you know seeing things as they are, not you know as they should be. The the should part of it, the morality part of it, the the appropriate part of it. Uh, makes us rather rather you know uh, constricted restricted in our approach and takes away that aspect of life which is which always offers challenges so uh, see the words here sublime private shortcomings of the individual concerned sublime private shortcomings shortcoming is a negative word it is it's a kind of weakness so something that you should not have but then it's a private thing so so would you have the private weakness Uh, the, the private region would you give any importance to the private region or would you give uh, full uh, you know uh, sympathy and support only to the public uh, you know uh, behavior this, this, this is a question of ethics this is a question of morality uh, but, but poets you know would like to uh, you know uh, value their privacy value their their their, their solitude in order to reflect upon uh, the, the, that particular experience and then look at the world from a different angle and uh, sublime is another uh, you know popular word with romantic poets sublime which is not very near the ground which 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 floats around uh, which which is difficult to capture but which is easy to feel and uh, therefore romantics uh, would like to uh, you know uh, enter into the realm of the sublime and would feel better there so you would see that uh, these recollections uh, actually were recapturings of the species the 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 uh, exchanges of ideas and exchanges of uh, information uh, of all the uh, lake poets who got together there who spent together time there and the time was from 1834 to 1839 five years and he is talking about these five years uh, the the uh, discussions that they had the the uh, you know points they shared with one another and the way they spent their time and i'm sure that uh, uh, this kind of uh, a poet with us in the 19th century Uh, who who took drugs who who uh, saw the effects of the drugs on his mind and uh, then gave insights into the the, the working of imagination uh, in personal terms uh, talking of reminiscences talking of recollections talking of experiences that he shares all this you know would have been of uh, great worth in order to understand the romantic kind of writing other writing is rational other writing is uh, uh, real and factual uh, but the factual and real uh completely uh, you know kept away from the, the the mysterious will offer a very bland picture of life and and that will not work so it is better you know that that, that writers are aware in the 19th century about that which they see and about that also which they do not see but but which they feel is there uh, in, in the background and that if that came forward then how would it finally uh, change uh, you know uh, the, the the picture uh, on 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 the page so this is the point that uh, <coughs> is, is important for romanticism and uh, then in confessions i i i i quote further preferring the depths of penetrating the depths of his own subconscious subconscious world how do we take this depth of one's own subconscious world in in, in the first place if it's subconscious then it's not in, in your control it's not in my control if it's conscious then i can tell you Uh, you you can tell yourself also very clearly that this is what the worth of the thing is but if it is unconscious subconscious subconscious means you, it's there and it's not there and you say one thing and the the the, the, the side picture always intrudes upon you so that way uh, the, the, the two remain there should we accept it or should we reject it now if, if one is an ascetic one would say this is wrong this is negative and therefore let's not keep it uh, in, in purview but then the romantic poets would say well this is how human imagination works human imagination should not should be discarded should not be expelled from uh, from, from the scope of life it should be made a part of life and imagination but as imagination is something that is not entirely in our control and if it is not in our control then we should try to understand its own you know peculiar ways so that we can enjoy being imaginative these days imagination is a, is a positive word but its positive nature was explored by uh, the 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 uh, romantic poet early romantic poet uh, de quincey and then he, it must, he must have uh, you know a lasting impact on the, the study of the mind the, the, that came up later more as a science than as a romantic pursuit so uh, i'm sure uh, viewers that uh, with these two uh, essays these two prose writers 
uh, we, we have come in touch with the problems of uh, the human mind and the problem of uh, you know, innocence and uh, you know uh, spontaneity that is there in normal life and uh, a lot of pleasure can be taken also from prose writings which would not be the case uh, in, in, in the earlier generations and which may not be the case today also when we engage ourselves with academic writing. But so far as romantic writing is concerned, prose also becomes very, 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 uh, 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 becomes very inspiring because through it we can go into the same areas from a different angle. So I, I, I hope uh, you will appreciate uh, the, the, these new new writers of prose, romantic prose. They are romantic essays, and they are putting the essay form to good use. Thank you.